This is a special event. It is the Heisman Trophy of defense. It is the award that gives back to a side of the ball that doesn't get as much glory. Thank you, Charlotte. What a high level of excellence Franco Nagurski brought to the game. He's an inspiration to anyone who loves the game of football. My football story is not about playing for the Carolina Panthers. My football story is from the time I was five years old, all I ever wanted to do was play for Wayne Hills High School in Northern New Jersey. I was a part of something, and the purpose of what we were working for was greater than any one of us. We come out every day to compete, and the only way we can get better is we, you know, compete against each other hard. It's important to note that sometimes the signs that we ask for are right there in front of us. Win or lose, there was always a message in there. It's about what we do, what the adversity we face. He can have a dream, but you better be prepared for that opportunity. I want to thank you all once again for the millions of dollars that you have contributed. And I know while the focus of the touchdown, the Charlotte Touchdown Club, might be football, the money that you provide enables multiple sports to benefit. It's a lot of hard work. I mean, it's, it's nothing is given. I mean, you have to earn everything. Honored to be here today. You do such wonderful work. The funds you raise for scholarships around the area, uh, that's wonderful. A very heartfelt thank you to members of the Touchdown Club for your support of 16,000 plus students who you all are impacting annually. Studies show that GPAs and graduation rates are higher, absences, and dropout rates are lower. What I've learned in my life is you can accomplish anything in this world. If you want to do something bad enough, you'll find a way. But it's important that everybody in this room and beyond understands that it starts with us. You see these kids on the come up, you gotta let them know. Football was a gladiator sport. Only gladiators played football. Tonight, you're going to get a glimpse of excellence of our finalists and what they have brought to this game. Their dedication, passion, and brute strength, along with their ability to make key plays during crucial moments in big games. I believe that football is the greatest game that there is. It's the only game where people of all sizes, of all shapes, of all different talent levels can come together. And everyone has to execute their job. And I believe young people should play. I believe it. It, it, it builds character, it teaches us how to sacrifice and be humble. Life is all about when you get punched in the gut. Finding a way to get up and dust yourself off and get back in the ring and just keep swinging, son. Just keep swinging. Be here, be back in North Carolina. See all, all, all you Wolfpackers and, and all you others again. What you do with this organization, with John and so many that contribute, it really is awesome. Because as we all know, sports, it may be more important now than it's ever been. You know, these high schools and what it's doing to help facilitate and bring joy and some discipline and virtue, it's awesome. And I think football is, is, a, is a lens and a window to our world, to our society when it comes to team. When you talk about together, everybody achieves more. There's nothing on that football field that's of accomplishment without the work of 10 other men. I actually came in a couple years and worked at Rock Hill. Learn a different discipline with each sport that you play, uh, or different disciplines. You also get a chance to be around different kids with each sport, so you become more of a social chameleon. Believe in you, believe in who you are and what you are, and it, it's a lot easier to make those decisions. And don't be afraid of the adversity. You know, sometimes, sometimes the adversity is exactly what you need in order to succeed. Football Writers Association of America and the Charlotte Touchdown Club are proud to present the 2020 Bronco Nagurski Trophy to Zayvon Collins from the University of Tulsa. Thank you to the Football Writers Association for presenting me this trophy and, you know, selecting me to be the Nagurski winner. Thank you to the Charlotte Touchdown Club for, um, you know, entrusting with me and, and be, uh, putting my name on the trophy. It really means a lot to me. Growing up around the game, I have a deep and abiding respect for those who have paved the way. Bronco Nagurski was a true pioneer of our game. All right, Charlotte Touchdown Club. How are you doing today? Ready for football season? Yeah. Jim Zoki, great to be back with you guys again. And uh, among my jobs, uh, of course, uh, Radio One, uh, one of the sponsors here today, WBT and WFNZ, is with the Carolina Panthers. 
and now in my 30th year on the broadcast team with the Panthers. Who else goes back all 30 years with the Panthers for your fandom? A couple hands out there. Good. Good. See. Where are my old people? Where are the old people? Your grandchildren are now Panther fans. And so we've had mostly great memories through the 30 years. We've had some just okay memories through the years. And we've had three really down seasons, as you know. But out of each one of those, I bring you today's message of hope, which will also involve our three guest speakers later today. You remember, of course, uh, 2001, Panthers went 1-15, in 15, which was the worst of all time. But then John Fox arrives. We go 7-9. and nine, And two years later, playing in a Super Bowl. So a quick turnaround out of the ashes of 2001. 2010, John's last year, 2-14, and 14, Ron Rivera comes in. 6 and 10 the next year, 7 and 9 after that, and then 12 and 4, three seasons after that, beginning a run of three straight division titles. So we've seen it twice before. We all know what just happened in 2023. New head coach in Dave Canales, and one of the Panther all time greats in Dan Morgan as the general manager. So lots of reasons for optimism. There's a history to this organization now, and we've got three great players that are going to talk about the past, share some stories, and talk about today's Panthers with us today with Al Wallace, Mike Rucker, and Jonathan Stewart. So looking forward to all of that. And uh, also want to thank all of our sponsors here as well. And Pinnacle Financial Partners, of course, is the big uh, luncheon uh, sponsor with this group as always. I mentioned the media partner, Radio One and WFNZ out there with Colin and Jeff Rickard doing their show today. And thank you to all the Touchdown Club sponsor team members for your ongoing support all these 30 years with the Charlotte Touchdown Club. Now let's bring him to the stage to get more information what's going on here with the Charlotte Touchdown Club. You know him well, the Charlotte Touchdown Club president. Welcome to the stage, Mr. Josh Schlechty. Josh. Good afternoon. See, I'm a little more interactive. Good afternoon. There we go, there we go. Everyone excited for football to be back? A little week zero, whatever that means, last Saturday. Didn't disappoint. Tonight, we kick off week one. Any NC State fans in the house? All right, there we go. Well, all weekend long, we got football, and we are one week away from NFL football. It's a glorious time of year, right? So to get going here, I want to thank the Panthers of your unbelievable partnership for the last 30 years, specifically with uh, today's guests of honor, Mike Rucker, Jonathan Stewart, and Al Wallace. Thank you for coming today. Sponsors, we couldn't do this without you. So every luncheon, I just sit here, pop off a little script, tell you thank you, and I roll off here. We'll mix it up a little bit today. So as I say your name, I want you to stand. Pinnacle Financial Partners, today's luncheon partner. See, somebody should be standing. All right, there we go. <laughs> Coca-Cola Consolidated. I want you to stay standing. Sorry, I should have been more specific. Coca-Cola Consolidated. Hertwig Family Foundation. Capital Group of Companies. Those are our Nagurski and Nagurski Awards sponsors. Now I'd like all companies that are a sponsor or individuals that are a sponsor of the Touchdown Club to stand. Should be a pretty big uprising now. If you're a sponsor of the Touchdown Club, please stand. So, so this part's going to take a minute because John Rocco is now going to run around and everybody who's not standing, he's going to get your cell phone number, your home address, and your social security number. Seriously, thank you guys all. You can be seated. We could not do this without you. What we do for the community, what we bring in is all at the hands of you. Everything that happens is due to our sponsors, and we just thank you so much each and every luncheon and every time you come along with us. There's a couple things. Hope they're already on your calendar. We talked about this at the last luncheon. I taught you how to put stuff in your phone on your calendar. October 18th, the final luncheon, and then December 9th, the 30th annual Bronco Nagurski Awards. Look forward to seeing everybody there. Thank you, and enjoy the luncheon.
Thank you, Josh. Great job as always. And uh, let's bring to the stage now Shannon Powell, the life coach, campus director for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at Wingate University for our invocation. And um, we'll get ready for lunch. Got a lot more coming up. We got raffle prizes to give away later. Of course, uh, some great speakers and a lot more coming up. Scripture says in Hebrews 10.25 that we ought not neglect meeting together, but rather to encourage one another. It feels like a good day for some encouragement. Would you pray together with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we pause today to express our thanks. Lord, the Scripture says that your mercy is new every day, and every day we need new mercy. We ask your blessing upon this meal. Lord, would you bless not only the food, but the beautiful hands that prepared it, as well as the ones who have so humbly served us today. I thank you, Lord, for my friend, John Rocco, his decades of leadership in this touchdown club and the beautiful city, Lord, that you've granted us. May your hand protect him and his family, and by your mighty hand, your blessings comfort him and all who serve with him. Lord, thank you for each of our sponsors today that support this great cause and for all who are in attendance with us. Please bless our protectors of peace, Lord. Shield those who fight for our freedoms and cause the light of our liberty to shine brightly around this world. We pray also for their families and for the family of fallen heroes and petition you for their comfort. Lord, we thank you for our beloved Carolina Panthers, for our coaches and players, for our trainers and cheerleaders, and all of our organizational staff. Bless them all, Lord, both past and present, with the peace of knowing their participation in this great game of football is nothing more than a platform to allow your greatness, the greatness of their creator, to shine forth in this world. And Father, finally, I make this simple request today. On behalf of every man, woman, and child present here, Lord, would you please give us faith so that as your word says in Proverbs 3, 5, that we may trust in you with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding in all of our ways, acknowledging you so that you will direct our paths. I pray these things in the name of the only one who lived and died to make us truly free, Christ Jesus alone. Amen. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shannon. So lunchtime, and we'll get back up here in about 30 minutes and uh, restart things. Uh, enjoy, and we'll be back here in about half an hour. So tell everybody that I'm mic'd up. So don't say nothing crazy. No, yes, I am. Okay, so I'm doing. I'll play for 11, you, number five. Oh, Bryce Young right there. I gotta show out. I gotta, I gotta show out. I gotta show out today. Y'all good? Y'all good? Oh, oh there's Mel Sanders. Yo. He got his 15 patterns. was crazy. Yeah, yeah, that was crazy. Hey, I'm mic'd up. Mic'd up. Yeah, I'm mic'd up. You gotta do something then. You gotta do yeah, something. Yeah, I know. Let's go, baby. Have some fun. Have some fun. Playmaker line right here. Got some fun today. Oh! Let me see something. I need a pick. Pick six. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember to push that off your shoulder. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When you when you hitting it, right? Push it to off your shoulder so you push it back to all your help. All right, good job. Pop one, and we want to say thank you. Thank you, all Panthers, man. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. And right, hey, here we go, family on three. One, two, three. Family. One day, my mama and my 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 dad gonna be up there watching me. And I'm gonna be on this field, and I'm gonna be on that field.
We have got three Panther legends that we're going to bring up in just a moment. But first, a short video. But Jonathan Stewart, Al Wallace, Mike Rucker will be up here in just a few minutes. We'll do a Q&A, have some great storytelling time with them coming up. But first, take a look at these three legends up on the big screens. All right, let's get ready to bring them up here in alphabetical order. This man played nine years as a Carolina Panther, 1999 to 2007. Second round pick out of Nebraska, where he was part of two national championship teams. Pro Bowl player in the NFL with the Panthers. Third all-time on the Panthers. Sack list, part of the greatest defensive line in team history, probably part of the greatest position unit in 30 years of Panthers football. Part of the Super Bowl 38 team, Big Rock, Mike Rucker. <laughs> Next up, the running back 10 years, a Carolina Panther from 2008 to 2017. First round pick out of Oregon when he was the 13th overall pick. You get first pick of chairs too, Mike, wherever you want to go. Pro Bowl player himself, the Panthers all time leading rusher, part of the Super Bowl 50 Great team, Jay Stu. Jonathan Stewart is here. Stu. They're just chanting A.J. Klein. Al Wallace, five of his nine NFL seasons with the Panthers from 2002 to 2006. University of Maryland began his NFL career with Jacksonville in 1997. One of the great Panther trades, acquiring him from the Miami Dolphins for Jay Williams, part of the Super Bowl 38 team as well in 2003, and part of that great same defensive line we talked about, and we'll talk about Julius Peppers and some of the others. The great Al Wallace is here with us today. Big Al. All right, so looking forward to some great storytelling. We're gonna catch up on some great memories. We're gonna move into the future and look at today's Panthers, who, by the way, are on the practice field right now, so they're getting preparations as their first practice since getting all the new waiver wire guys, all the free agents they brought in right now. So Panthers hard at work as we're speaking here. And uh, Jay Stu, for you, what's, what's it like when you start getting to this point where the preseason is behind you 
and you're getting ready for regular season football. Every team's optimistic right now. It's go time. You know, everything that you've been prepping for in the off season, training, all the hard work, the sacrifices, um, this is where it counts. And so during this time, you got a week off, you're basically just trying to make sure you heal up any nicks and bruises um, and just get to, you know, have a mental check, you know, kind of recover your brain, spend time with your, your, your family, um, you know, but you obviously have an opponent that's coming up here, especially if it's a division, division opponent, the Saints, this means a lot. So if I'm a guy, I'm watching a little bit of film during this week on what's ahead. Yeah, so I'll start with the division game right away. Home opener against the L.A. Chargers week two after that. Uh, Mike, for you, you've been out of the game a little bit longer than Stu. Is, is there a part of you that misses this time of year getting ready for the regular season? Or as you are further away from it, do you kind of admire it from a distance? But what's kind of your view? Well, I, I would say this event right here was like this internal clock as I was rolling up coming in here. Like, it reminded me of preseason, like, it was go time. Like, we would usually come to this event, get on buses, finish our preseason game, and then it was the start of the season. So I actually kind of got some butterflies coming to the event this morning. So, uh, But I would say that the, the one thing that I truly, truly miss about the game is this brotherhood, right? This is a, a group of guys that, you know, you get picked, you pair down, and no matter what, no matter where you came from, skin color, background, you're there for one goal, and that's to win a, a championship. And so this, this guy, the guys that are out there right now, that's their goal. They are formulating that bond right now that can't be duplicated anywhere else. And that's the one thing that I miss about the game is the practical jokes. Like, <laughs> you know, you, can, you can't wake your wife up with smelling salt. It just, it, it just, that won't work. You could do that in the locker room or in the meeting room, but that doesn't work at home. And that's the kind of things that you miss. <laughs> Which begs the follow-up question, did you in fact try that with your wife? I thought about it, but I, I was smarter than that. They want to sleep outside. So he didn't actually do it, but uh, if one of you want to go home and try that tonight, certainly report back at the Patrick Willis event. Let us know how that went for you. Al, for you, um, these, these guys were drafted here. You started with Jacksonville. You played for a couple teams. For the new players, there's a lot of 21 new faces before the additions came in. So I, th I think we're approaching 30 new players on this roster now for this year from last year. What's it like when you're a veteran guy that moves to a new team and you have to assimilate quickly? Yeah, this is a difficult time. And uh, like Ruck, I kind of had some deja vu, some of the memories uh, that came up for me. Like you said, not like these two studs. I was undrafted, so I had to do it the hard way. <laughs> and uh, my heart just just rips when I see the guys' dreams just kind of walk out the door as these, these teams, they go down from 90 to 53 players. Uh, but it is in a time of excitement. Uh, a lot of things are happening for these uh, guys, opportunity to go out and uh, become part of a team, become part of a brotherhood for me that has lasted for 20, 30 years. And you got to appreciate that part of it. But it's excitement. It's kickoff. Our bodies, as old as we are now, we still feel it. We still know that it's go time, like Stu said. Football season is here. You couldn't be more excited. And the fact that we're 30 years old, I mean, we're getting some real history to this organization, such as Julius Peppers going into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. That's a proud moment. That's a true draft pick, long career with the Carolina Panthers. But keep it with you, Al. You had to back up that guy and this guy and do some spot starting, obviously, as well with Mike Rucker and those guys. But truly, the greatest defensive line. You think about Chris Jenkins, Brenton Buckner, the players that were like that there. As you look back, what a collection uh, of talent that you were a part of. It was incredible uh, getting drafted here and walking in that room uh, with a 20-year-old Julius Peppers at the time and trying to connect and bond with the guys to fall into a situation where I, I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to make sure that every time I ran on the field that Dan Morgan or Mike Rucker or you know, any of the guys didn't think that the talent was going to drop off because number 96 was coming in. So it was a tremendous amount of pressure. But now that I look at it, one guy in the Hall of Fame Pro Bowl talent all over the place. Um, I feel very fortunate and blessed to have been able to have that opportunity and been given the opportunity by John Fox and Mike Turgovac and Sal Sinceri to be a part of such a special group in 2003. And Mike, for you, you were that bookend with, with Julius Peppers all those many years. Both of you beating the quarterback at the same time a lot of times. Just take us back to that, that time and what a unique player Julius was. Just his abilities are somewhat unmatched as far as any kind of skill set we've seen in the NFL. 
Well, you know, when you, when you think about Pat, like obviously um, we, we came off a rough season, so he owes me and that team for getting him picked because we had that 1-15 season. <laughs> so, um, but it, it was a blessing for us because, you know, the thing about Pat, you know, being uh, from here, going to college here, being a dual sport guy, and then and being drafted. I had seen, I'd played with Reggie White. I'd seen what 300 pounds look like. Um, I played with Kevin Green, where you saw what a thin, fast guy looks like. But then when this guy walks in the room and he's almost 300 pounds and he's got no fat and he's six seven, like you're like, where did he? This look like he man. Like where, where did they make him up at? And then when you saw his demeanor and then him get on the field and some of his ability, we had a front row seat of something special. At that time, we didn't know what he was going to turn into. We knew what you know people talked about, but to now be able to celebrate him and his accomplishments. And you, you talk about a guy who could, you know, bask in the sun and talk about himself, pat himself on the back. He does the opposite. He gives back. He's like, no, that happened because my D tackle or because of my linebackers, just to solve the earth. And so to be able to go up to Canton and to help celebrate him and to be able to see him talk about his family, to see his, his kids see him go into the Hall of Fame uh, was just remarkable, really cool. And for you, Stu, uh, perspective of just like, what it was like having him here. I, I'm trying to think back. There had to be some games where you went against him, I would think, at some point along the way, too. Yes. Um, you know, it's never fair when a running back has to block a defensive end. <laughs> and uh, when he played for Green Bay and in, in Chicago, a couple of occasions of, of meeting Julius Peppers on the edge happened. And I honestly think because we played together, it went well. <laughs> it went well. Um, no, but, you know, my rookie year seeing guys like Julius Peppers, Steve Smith, um, you know, me being from the West Coast, these are the guys that, you know, people's jerseys are, you know, being sold on the West side, right? So me coming here, I obviously knew these guys, but seeing Julius Peppers at his locker for the first time, I'm like, and this was, in, this was in Wofford. And I remember he had three lockers to himself. <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, well, of course he has three lockers to himself because he needs two because he's large and then one for all his stuff. And, you know, it was a mind-blowing experience just like to be a rookie coming in and getting introduced to the NFL by obviously a Hall of, Hall of Fame talent at that time you know, me going to go play the Falcons and going to go play other teams and seeing their defensive ends, it made it much easier, you know, as, as far as how our practices went. Now, as far as practice goes, John Fox held them out of a lot of team, into, you know, team drills. So team, meaning offense, defense, Julius wasn't really allowed to, to participate in that because he would ruin practice <laughs> if he actually went full go. So um, Julius Peppers is a solid earth. Um, he deserves it. And echoing what they just said, um, just proud to be able to play alongside him. Yeah, big part of Panthers history, one of the biggest parts. I mentioned that defensive lines, too. Uh, when you think about your position running back, for you know, a brief window, Stephen Davis uh, with that combination, uh, of what he was able to do when you think back to his era back in that Super Bowl 38 team with Deshaun Foster, but you and D'Angelo Williams, running mates for a long time, I mean, by far the best running back duo. As you look back at that, you guys put up some crazy numbers, and obviously credits the offensive line and the whole team for that as well, but what a great era of just being able to run the ball the way you guys did as 1,000-yard rushers year in and year out. Yeah, man, it was an easy, I call it the easy days, right? Um, you know, play defense and run the ball. Uh, and, and that's the way John Fox really wanted it. Um, you know, Coach Davison did a good job of just depending on the running game at all times. I mean, it'd be three and third and 11, and he draws up a, a draw with an option to throw a bubble to Steve Smith. And people thought we were crazy, but we would convert. I mean, I remember seeing D'Angelo, like maybe it was like third and 13, we we're playing the Cardinals. And he dials his play up. Steve Smith's pissed off. And <laughs> Shocking development there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we run this draw. 
And actually, it was second. It was like second and 13. We run this draw, and then we run it again, the same exact play. And Smitty comes into the huddle, and he looks at Jake, and he says, don't you call that play. <laughs> and he called it, and he threw Smitty the bubble, and Smitty took it the distance, just angry. Just caught the ball <laughs> and just took off running for a touchdown out of anger. Uh, <laughs> but I just look back and, you know, me and D'Angelo had a great time just, you know, trusting each other, understanding, you know, hey, I'm tired right now. It's better for my teammate to come in to spell me so that way we just have fresh legs at all time. And that's the reason why I said it was the easy days um, because it was legitimate, it legitimately felt very easy. I mean, we had Jeff Ota, you know, he was drafted the same year that I was drafted. And so as far as me feeling comfortable running to the right side with him, Kendrick, or, or Kedrick Vincent, um, and then obviously Ryan Khalil as our center. Uh, we had Piggy to the left. We had uh, Jordan Gross to, to our left, you know, blind side. So the comfort level of those guys in front of us is what made it work. And... Um, can't get those days back. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely a good time. Yeah, and you came in at a high when the team was performing well. And we'll come back to you in a minute, talk about then it dips down and it comes back up for you. For you, Al, you, know, you came in right on that front edge of uh, John Fox's first year here for the Super Bowl season as well. So you kind of caught that wave of this organization at a great time. Was there a feeling in 2002 when that team improved, obviously prior to your time here, from being that one-win team to being a seven-win team. Did you feel something special that might be occurring in 2003 heading into that Super Bowl year? Yeah, I think the first thing I felt was that this team was 1-15. I'm going to make this roster. That's what I was thinking. Somebody's going to lose a job, right? <laughs> but all jokes aside, when I walked in there, it looked like a bunch of guys that were hungry. And John Fox laid down the law pretty early in training camp that he wanted smart, tough guys and that he was going to go out there and find them. And now the CBA as it exists today wasn't in place, so he grinded it out. I mean, it was two-a-day practices. It was heat. I mean, we were in those cold tubs. It was physical. It was fast. And he was building something, a culture, an identity for this program. And you saw all the young talent, a raw Chris Jenkins, an unknown Steve Smith Sr. who became – uh, Agent 89, all those pieces were in place. And I can just remember on a personal note being told, I don't care where you're coming from. I don't care what you were doing prior to this. We're going to give you a chance. If you can play football, you're going to play football. And that sounded good to me because two months prior, I was an assistant principal of a high school. So that <laughs> sounded like a pretty good deal. But that opportunity to go out and be with these mix of guys and to see it come together through the grind of a preseason in that early season, down 17 points, uh, a couple of years later, and here comes Jake DeLome, you knew that the things that we had baked in 2002 were coming to fruition in 2003. We did never, we never dreamed we would end up in Houston in the Super Bowl, but we knew we had something special, that we were a band of brothers, and you were gonna have to, you were gonna have to die to beat us on a football field. We became the Cardiac Cats. Absolutely. And Mike, for you, you kind of go back the furthest out of this group of three players here. You were here for the George Seifert years, and actually the first two were, you know, like 500-ish kind of years, and there's a Steve Berline, a lot of good momentum there. That last year, was it just mind-numbing after that first win to not win another game, and then you were part of that, obviously, the ascent all the way to Super Bowl 38? Yeah, it, it was kind of interesting because it looked like we were trending in the right direction, new coach and everything, and um, I remember vividly um, in 2001, we'd go up and we'd beat a very good Minnesota team. Um, they had John Randall, Chris Carter, Randy Moss, Cole Pepper, and I just remember coming home and saying, man, we, we, this might be our year. Like, we were trending in the right direction. And I didn't know that we were going to lose the next 15 games, uh, <laughs> lo and behold. But I tell you this, so people say, well, what, are, what are some of your highlights um, of your career? And I always bring up that 2001 15 team because – it brought out something in you if you were a fighter. Um, there, I saw guys that would collect their checks and wouldn't care the product they put on the field. Um, I saw guys give up, but I also saw guys fight. And that's my DNA was to fight and push back. My thing was if you got on that plane as the other team, you might have won 70 to nothing. But you're going to say, hey, that guy, that number 93, it was 60 minutes and he gave me everything. And there was going to be respect because that film is our resume. Um, when, when that game on Sunday, it goes to all other 31 teams. 
including ours. So that's your resume. Win or lose, they're going to look at that other teams know and other players know. And I wanted that respect. And so um, I learned a lot about myself. And I don't think I would be the player I am, I was um, in nine years than if I didn't have that one year where things didn't go right. Because I had to learn how to lose. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But coming from college where you win three national championships and in a four-year span you only lose, you know, a couple games, I didn't know how to lose. And so that was very hard on myself. I had to find a way that I could take that loss, process it the right way, use it in the right way, and then push out a different type of product. That's yeah, a great, great lesson. A great lesson for you fans coming off of last year to keep that in mind for future successes here. And Stu, for you, you come in in 2008 as a rookie. You go 12-4, and four, playoff team. Two years later, you're on 2-14 and 14 with the same coach, John Fox. Ron Rivera comes in. Cam Newton comes in. But you know, take us before the ascent. That same thing Mike's talking about, that dip. What did, what did you take out of that 2-14 and 14 season that's kind of life lessons that you kind of built your character and the rest of your life on? Yeah, 2-14, and 14, we lost to the Cleveland Browns that year. <laughs> and I always thought to myself, we'll never lose to the Cleveland Browns. By the Cleveland way, the Cleveland Browns. Browns are an NFL football team, for those who don't know. <laughs> but um, it, was a ch it was a challenging, challenging year. I mean, me, for my personal self, I mean, I battled injuries throughout my whole entire career. Um, but 2-14 and 14 really... I think brought the guys that stayed, you know, from that point until the time that we went to the Super Bowl. You talk about the DNA of the locker room and just kind of echoing again what they have experienced. You know, you have to go through some things. Mm -hmm. You have to experience growth. And when you experience growth, it hurts. And it only hurts if you stick around for it. And Two and 14, we really kind of started seeing, at least for me, how certain players, you know, would fold and how certain players would rise. And we might not win games, but you start earning the respect of guys that are still battling when they know they are not making the playoffs, when they know they're making plans, you know, in October as far as what their offseason plans are going to look like, right? So... I took, you know, man, this guy I can trust, and I hope that they see that in me. And every time I step on that field, I got to give it everything that I got because we're going to get a new coaching staff next year, and they might not like me if they turn on the film, they see that I'm not working hard, right? And so my mindset as far as how the business of football runs channeled that year. And... It's, it, again, it, it's a team game, but if you're doing your job, like, you'll be okay. And th this game is all about longevity. And, you know, I credit that year to my success as far as being able to be a, pam uh, a Panther for 10 years um, and reaching the, the all-time leading rusher, like, award or whatever, right? Because it was my tenure. It was the length of my time. Um, and all those types of things, you know, I look at 2014, right? 2014, we made the playoffs at, what, six, nine, and one? Yeah, seven, eight, and one. Seven, eight, and one. And you had to win, like, your last four or something four like that to even make that happen, yeah. So I'm going to tell you something. So take the team, Thomas Davis, Ryan Khalil, um, just the guy, the, the, the beef of the guys, right? And 2014, we go to Minnesota and we're playing the coldest game I've ever played in my entire life. And literally, we looked at each other and said, uh-uh, <laughs> we don't want to be here. Um, and we lost that game. Special teams, we played, played terrible. Um, it was just a bad showing. And I remember in that locker room, Coach Rivera looked at us and he didn't even say anything because he knew that we didn't show up. He gave us a halftime spiel, cursed us out. But after the game, he was like, I don't want to hear it. Just show up next week. And in that moment, in that locker room, on the, play, on the plane ride, on the team meeting on Monday, all you can sense is this urgency of 
we can't do that anymore. That's not who we are. And from that moment on, we went to go play the Saints, we beat the Saints, and we ended up finishing the regular season strong, went to the playoffs, like won a playoff game, go to Seattle, and we lose. And when we lost, this, when we lost in Seattle, everybody was thinking to themselves, oh, we'll be back next year. I remember some, young, some of the younger guys saying, oh, we'll be back next year. I'm like, hey, you're gonna have to put your hard hat on. And lo and behold, we go 15 and one. Make it to the Super Bowl, get to the top of the mountain, and realize there's a peak. Oh man, we don't we don't have a ladder, <laughs> so we end up losing. So, but uh, but I do say that with you know enjoy the journey, enjoy the process because it is the maker of who you are. It's great stories, and um, so all three of you played on a Super Bowl team that did not win that Super Bowl. I'll come back down the line to you, Stu, and start with with Al. Obviously. If you could go back and do it, you'd all like to have walked out with the Lombardi Trophy and in one. But now with the benefit of hindsight, as you look back, would it have changed your life? Would it, obviously, you'd have a different story to tell, but you know, what does that mean just perspective-wise that you'd like to have had that, but uh, as you look back from a distance now, uh, as big of a deal, or how do, you, how do you feel about it? Yeah, it took about 10 years. I think we did uh, a video shoot kind of rewatching that game for the first time. I did not watch it for 10 years and uh, was working with and working around Marty Herney at the time. And he would always say it, man, if we come away and walk away with the Super Bowl championship ring, all of our lives are different. You carry that title. You carry that pride. No, you know, that, that's the ultimate goal when we play this game. So it was tremendously disappointing to go to Houston and to come up short uh, on an Adam Vinatieri kick when we played our hearts out. You go back and watch that game. It took 10 years for me to rewatch it, but when I did, the amount of pride that I'm filled with, with the effort and the product that we put out on the field against the now legendary Tom Brady was incredible. From Jake DeLone to Ricky Manning Jr. to you just name it. Dan Morgan, uh, Moose owns a record. Dan probably has more tackles in the Super Bowl than anybody else. So what I remember most is that win or lose, I mean, we were the Carolina Panthers and we were playing for something different that year. We were playing for Sam Mills and win or lose that football game, I know in my heart that Sam's tremendously proud of us and we played with that keep pounding mentality that he sent us off with the first preseason game in Bank of America Stadium against the Cowboys I believe so yeah life is different life is certainly different with that title behind your name Super Bowl champion but uh, when I look back on what we were able to accomplish that brotherhood the memories the journey that we took ourselves through as the cardiac cats is something that um, you know I pass on to my kids and just excited to be about living here in the Carolinas. Same question, Mike. That was a close Super Bowl, obviously, 32-29. Tom Brady, Patriots, Panthers were decidedly an underdog in that game. As you look back at that, uh, the accomplishment of getting that far, but yet not winning that final game, what, what's, what's your distance perspective as you look back at that now? I, I, I believe that we, we gave it our all. Um, when, when I think about that, obviously not holding up that that final trophy is, is the one you want. But I think the thing that kind of like sticks with me is I go back two weeks before that when we won the NFC championship game. And we, we for the first time in the city in the Carolinas, uh, we've done something together for the first time. And to come back and to see the, the, the fire trucks and our police officers all in our fan base in the parking lot I just still capture that moment of what that looks like, us pulling into the parking lot at like two, three o'clock in the morning. And I so wanted to hold the trophy up, but I so wanted that feeling again times 10 with our fan base. That's what I miss, is not being able to finish it together and to be able to celebrate like we did that NFC Championship game. Um, that's what probably sticks with me the most. Um, now the good thing is, uh, we've all experienced the Super Bowl. Um, we'll, we will get to experience it together when we do get to hold up a trophy as a city and as the Carolinas. That will happen, right? Um, when, we don't know, but that's what they're striving to do, and I, I can't wait for that day. Um, so it's been more about the fan base that has uh, kind of made me think uh, the what-ifs um, back then. Yeah, great, great insight. And then for you, Stu, that team... You said 15-1. It was 17-1 by the time you got to the Super Bowl. You guys 
destroyed the Arizona Cardinals here. Um, so you were the favorite. So it was a different perspective as far as how that game should have played out. Just in a nutshell, what do you think went wrong that day against Denver because you, you were the better team heading into it? And as you look back at that now, you know, how did that change your life or impact you? Um, you know, I think our preparation was a little stagnant. Um, you know, you have two weeks to prepare, and I think going in, uh, we, we had this mindset of maybe treating this like an ordinary game. And to be honest, it's not an ordinary game. It's a Super Bowl. So you got to treat it like the biggest game of your life. And your preparation throughout that week, being away for a week and, 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 and being away from your family and all those types of things, it has to be as if this is the most different, most exciting thing that's going to happen in your, in your entire life. Um, and for the most part, like, you know, we handled it the right way, but I think our preparation, um, we could have prepared differently. Um, you know, scheme-wise, whatever it is, just kind of buying into something that, is, was, that was different than our regular season because the Broncos came in there and they said, this is what they do. Um, all we got to do is make sure we hold them here and we'll win. And that's basically what they did. Um, but I will say, uh, Kotri caught that ball. Yes. <laughs> Confirmation if any of your friends and, asked you. And if, he, if we would have had that catch, who knows what would have happened, right? Um, but as far as like, you know, how I see it now, again, I still haven't seen the whole entire game. Um, I've seen clips in here from U YouTube or Instagram on accident. And I, and I remember like the first two years, I would actually like look, I'll see it on accident and I'll turn my head. Cause it's like, I don't want to see the proof of why we lost. Mm -hmm. And, but you know, one of the things that I'll remember most is on our way back, on our way to the Super Bowl, driving down West Boulevard to the, to the airport, seeing the amount of fans over on West Boulevard, standing on the sidewalks, standing on the streets, standing in their neighborhood, like standing on top of trucks, waving the Panther flag, like tailgating basically on the side of the street, knowing that we're going to the Super Bowl and knowing when we came back that we had nothing to show for, that hurt. And coming back on West Boulevard, there they were. They were there the whole, like they never left. Still waving their flag, saying, good job, even though you lost. <laughs> but, you know, you know, it gives you this sense of pride and, and obviously it's so hard to get there. And, you know, you go in the next season thinking, all right, we're gonna try our best to get there. And it's just, you know, it settles in and it's just that hard. Um, but it definitely would have changed my life. Um, it would have changed the city. Um, I think the city's in a great place right now, but it, you know, if anyone was here in 2015, it was a time to be alive, man. And everywhere you went, the energy was different, and it was a beautiful time. And um, as Stu knows, the Cleveland Browns have never been to a Super Bowl, so you got that on them too. <laughs> Always back to the Browns. Got to wrap it up, but real quick, just maybe less than a minute for each of you. Uh, Panthers on the practice field right now. You've all given these examples and these stories of coming out of hard records. Last year was two and 15, and you guys have done this. You've, you've gone and been guest speakers. You go to practice, you talk to the team in the locker room, that kind of thing. What, uh, share with us, Al, what you would say to this Panthers team as they try to build off of two and 15 to become what they want to be. Yeah, I say seize the moment. This is a great opportunity uh, for Dave Canales, uh, our guy, Dan Morgan, who is now the general manager uh, of the team, sees the moment and the opportunity that's in front of you. Everyone is gonna tell you what you are not, but you control what you will be. And for this team and Dave Canales, I see a direction, I see a culture starting to be built and a foundation with the types of players uh, that Dan Morgan has envisioned Dave Canales wants in this program. And I think for me, that is so refreshing to now see this team turned 
put back on the right road and starting to move forward. And I'm excited about them, especially starting in the division with an opportunity to go on the road, opening day, uh, the Saints. Uh, I just believe in Dan Morgan and Dave Canales. And with those two, just my conversations, of course, all the time with Dan, just meeting uh, Dave and the look that he has uh, when we talk, that this guy is genuine, he wants to win, he knows how to get it done, and now he's going to pass that along to the 53 that they've decided over the last couple of days. So for me, uh, seize the moment, be exactly where you're supposed to be, and go out there and fight. Let's get back to the keep pounding mantra. Let's get back to what the Carolina Panthers used to be, and I'm going to repeat what Dan Morgan said. Let's play like some dogs. And Rock, uh Al referenced uh, Dan Morgan, your teammate, uh, for both of you guys there. He has a GM role now. He wants to get some dogs. He's talking about that old mentality that you guys were all a part of here. What, what's, he, what's your talk to the team of today? I say, you know, the first thing is um, keep it simple, right? One game at a time. It's a cliche, but it's really simple if you can do it. And at the end of the day, run the ball, stop the run, right? I mean, you just keep it as simple as that. Run the ball, stop the run. You get your big guys like Derek Brown, and when you, when you start with that kind of foundation with your offensive and defensive line, a lot of things will come. And so I think a lot of times you'll hear a lot of noise out there of this and this, where they place you, where they rank you. At the end of the day, turn the noise off. It's your teammates, and it's that game. It's week one, stop the run, run the ball, and everything else will take care of itself. I think you would second that part of it, run the ball. Yeah, run the ball. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, yeah, man, just be where your feet are. Um, you know, you don't, we don't never, anyone in here, we won't know where we're going to be next year. We won't know where we're going to be tonight, besides hopefully in our bed, right? But we don't know what time that's going to be. We don't know the intricacies of the details. But the one thing that you can control is yourself. You can control your ape. This is the thing that Coach Rivera used to always say. Mm -hmm. Control your inner ape which is your attitude, your preparation, and your effort. And so be where your feet are with that mindset, and everything else will take care of itself. So Good words. Folks, before we go, I want to thank all of our sponsors here today, as, as always, with the Pinnacle Partner Groups, uh, Radio One Charlotte for being here, as always, the WBT, WFNZ. Thanks to all of our sponsors, Charlotte Touchdown Club. Thanks for your time. Let's hear it for Al Wallace, Mike Rucker, Jonathan Stewart. Next event, October 18th. Hall of Fame inductee Patrick Willis, thank you all for being here. <laughs>